Hey guys, uh, this is a lecture on solving radical equations. Let's get started. So as a review from what we talked about in the last section, here's a review of the square root property. We use the square root property whenever we have some quantity squared equals a constant. And the way we get rid of this square is by taking the square root of both sides. Remember, whenever you take the square root, we look at the plus or minus, and then plus or minus root 9 gives us plus or minus 3. So the, the bottom line was that in order to clear the square, in order to get rid of this square, we needed to take the square root of both sides. That's this thing, the radical. Now what happens if instead of having a square, we have a square root? Well, the same exact thing happens in reverse. So in order to clear a square root, we square both sides. So what that means is, if I have square root of x equal to 9, in order to get rid of this radical, I would need to square both sides. I guess I really should have written this in big red letters because that's the most important aspect of this entire section. We do not square individual terms, even though that's what it looks like here. I'm squaring the entirety of the left-hand side and I'm squaring the entirety of the right-hand side. So I would pause here, make sure you have notes on this, make sure you remember that we are squaring both sides. That's, that's the most important key for this entire section. Now here, uh, we, we check our answer. So we get, you know, if we square the square root of x, we just get x by itself. When we square 9, we get 81. And now we can check our answer. If we were to plug in 81 into the original equation, which was square root of x equals 9, when we find the square root of 81, we get 9. Is 9 equal to 9? Yes, so I get a check mark. That means x equals 81 is a solution to this equation. Anytime you clear an even index, so this was a square root index of 2. Anytime you clear an even index, you must, this is not a suggestion or a choice. You don't have a choice in the matter. This is non-negotiable. Anytime you clear an even index, you have to check your answers. You don't have to do this with odd indices, even though I personally always do it as a way of making sure that what I've done is correct. So for something like this, we have a fourth root, which is an even root. Here, after you solve the question, I, I didn't actually solve it, I just wanted to give an example of, if I have an even index, I have to check my answer. It's mandatory. It's a requirement at the end. But if I have a cube root instead, checking is optional, but I always do it just to be sure. So let's run into a couple of examples. Here we have the square root of 7x plus 2 equals 4. Now I have a single term on each side, so what I can do here is I can take the square of both sides, and that will get rid of this radical. So if I multiply a radical by itself, I get just what the radicand is. So I get uh, 7x plus 2 for the quantity squared is just 16. Now I would pause here and maybe take notes on the fact that this equation is a linear equation. We solved linear equations in chapter two, way back at the beginning of the semester. So the, the purpose of chapter seven is almost to come full circle and say, how is it that we can use radicals, uh, the stuff that we learned in chapter four, and the stuff that we learned in chapter two to put it all together and be able to solve slightly more annoying questions or more meaty problems. So these questions, especially in this section, uh, as we move on with further examples, you're going to see that you really have to pull in stuff from chapter two, three, four, five, basically everything that we've done the entire semester kind of gets tested in these questions. So 7x equals 16 minus 2. We subtract the 2 over. That should be pretty easy. 16 minus 2 is 14. And then we can divide both sides by 7 yielding x equals 14 over 7, which is 2. 
Now, remember that because this question had an even index to start with, we must check our answer. X equals two is just a potential solution. We don't know that it is a solution or not. Whenever you have an even index, you have to check to see if this number you get at the end is indeed a solution or not. So let's do that. In the original equation that we were given, I replaced the X with the two. And notice that I have these question marks over these equal signs. The reason for that is because we're trying to see if the left hand side is the same as the right hand side. We don't know that that's the case. We cannot just assume that these two quantities are the same. So seven times two is 14, 14 plus two is 16, square root of 16 is four. And is that the same on the right hand side? Yes, so I get a little check mark here. So what this tells us is that x equals two is indeed a solution to this original equation that we started with. Next example for something like this. Now, instead of a square root, I have a cube root. Well, when we had cubes, we would get rid of them by taking the cube root of both sides. So if I have a cube root, I'll get rid of it by taking the cube of both sides. So when I do that, the cube and the cube root cancel each other out, leaving behind just the radicand, which is x minus one. Negative four times negative four is 16. 16 times negative four is negative 64. And then to end, we can take this uh, negative one, move it over to the other side, it becomes a positive one. Negative 64 plus one gives us a negative 63. Now here you might say, well, we have an odd index, so this must be right. That's only the case if you're confident that you didn't make a mistake anywhere along the way. I always check my answers to see, just to see if I made a mistake or not. So it's more of a backup. So my rule of thumb is anytime I solve an equation, I always check my answers because then I don't have to remember, oh, do I check it on an even index? Do I check it on an odd index? I don't have to worry about that. I always check my answers regardless of what the index is. So if we do that, we plug in negative 63 and you can verify that you know you end up getting negative four equals negative four, which is a true statement. So that means x equals negative 63 is a solution to our equation. With this example, we have a fourth root. Well, again, we're just following the same trends of what we did earlier. So if we had a square root, we squared both sides. If we had a cube root, we took the cube of both sides. If we have a fourth root, which is an even index, we have to raise both sides to the fourth power. When I do that, the radicand remains, three X plus six is by itself. And then when I take this right hand side to the fourth power, I get 81 by itself. Now, this is a linear equation, pretty easy to solve these. Uh, and in fact, I forgot to draw your attention to that here as well. This is also a linear equation. Uh, this one I did mention that this was a linear equation, but you'll notice that we, after we clear the radicals, we were left with the linear equation in all three examples so far. So three X plus six equals 81 should be fairly uh, non-threatening. Subtract the six over from the other side. Um, we get 81 minus six, which is 75. Divide both sides by three, yielding X equals 25. This is a potential solution. We don't know that it is a solution for sure or not. We must check because the index is even. And the reason for that is X equals 25 actually turns out to not be a solution. And if you had never checked it, you would not know. And you would have written X equals 25 as a solution. So if you plug it in, you end up getting three equals negative three, which obviously is incorrect. So X equals 25 is not a solution to this equation. And if this was the only solution that was even possible, there are no other solutions that to consider or that could be uh, solutions. Now, if we were to get an answer, 
but it is not a solution to the equation. We can call it either an extraneous solution or a false solution. And here I formalized it. Since the only potential solution, x equals 25 was a potential solution, did not turn out to be 1, we say that the equation has no solutions. Now, before we move on, please note that for each of the questions above, the radical was isolated. What I mean by that is, this radical is by itself on one side with nothing next to it. So there's no plus 5 or 3 in front of it. Here, radical by itself. Radical by itself. Oops, too fast. Radical by itself. So these were the easier examples, but I wanted to get across the idea of basically what we have to do. But if the radical is not by itself, we have to isolate it first before we raise both sides to a power. So for instance, for a question like this, the radical 4x plus 1 is not by itself. So we have to get rid of this x first before we square both sides. We do not want to square things where they are. So the first thing we need to do is isolate the radical. So in order to get this by itself, I can take the x and I subtract it over to the other side. Now once the radical is isolated, I can square both sides to clear this radical. Notice I said clear, uh, sorry, I said square both sides. The most common mistake in this section is that students will square the left-hand side fine, but when it comes to squaring the right-hand side, they will square the 5 individually and square the x individually. Incorrect. Cannot do that. Not negotiable. The only thing we're allowed to do is raise both sides to a certain power. Never individual terms. Never, ever, 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 ever individual terms. So when we raise 5 minus x to the second power, here is where chapter 4 comes in to help us. Because if we remember this formula, a minus b the quantity squared is a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. We can notice that the radical will vanish here, so leaving behind just 4x plus 1. a squared will be 5 squared, which is 25, minus 2ab, 2 times a is 10, times b is 10x. So 10x comes here, plus b squared. So x squared goes right there. And again, if you don't know these formulas yet, uh, you're asking for a whole bunch of trouble. Um, please make sure you know them. Otherwise, you can always foil your way out of this, even though it's not going to be pleasant to do that. Now, what I want you to observe here is what type of equation this is. This is not a linear equation because I have an x squared in it. Whenever we have x squared as the highest power, hopefully you remember that this is actually a quadratic equation. So linear equations were all the examples that we saw earlier. Uh, 3x plus 6 equals 81. And then you solve it like the way we did in chapter 2. Anytime you have a quadratic equation, the stuff that we did in section 7.1 will come back in. So now you can either say, okay, if I want to solve this by factoring, I have to set it equal to zero. If I want to use the quadratic formula, I have to set it equal to zero. So all those things kind of come into play. Now, what we can do is we can move the 4x plus 1 to the right-hand side. So the 4x will become negative, and the 1 will become negative as well. We can combine like terms, so we would get x squared, negative 10x minus 4x is negative 14x, 25 minus 1 is 24. Excuse me. Now at this stage, we have a quadratic equation, and it equals 0. So we start thinking about factoring first. So let's think about the GCF. There is no GCF. How many terms? Three terms. Could any of the formulas work? Uh, maybe. Signs are okay. x squared is a perfect square, but 24 is not, so formulas are thrown out as well. The leading coefficient of x squared is 1, so AC method is actually the thing that we use. 
and I did the factoring here, so I wrote down a1 times c, 24, 1 times 24 is 24, and then I wrote out all the factors of 24 in order. Now we want factors that add up to negative 14, which are negative 2 and negative 12. So because we're using the AC method, the factors are x minus 2 and x minus 12. And then using the zero product property, also from section 7.1, we can say that x minus 2 must equal 0, which gives us x equals 2. And then x minus 12 must equal 0, which gives us x equals 12. Please note again that these are two potential solutions. We don't know if they're solutions or not. The original equation had an, an even index. So here we have to check to see if both or one or maybe none are solutions. So if we check our answers, when we plug in two, we end up getting five equals five. So x equals two turns out to be a solution. But if we plug in 12, we actually end up getting 19 equals 5. That means the number we plugged in originally, 12, is not a solution. So x equals 2 is the only solution. x equals 12, because it didn't yield a, a true statement at the end, was either we can talk about it as a false solution or an extraneous solution. Same thing. Something like this where we have two radicals. Well, remember that we said we need to isolate the radicals. So if you have two of them, get one on each side. So in order to isolate the radical, we can move this radical x over to the right-hand side and make it a positive radical x. Once the radical is isolated, we can square both sides. 3x minus 8 comes down here because a square and the radical cancel each other out. Square root of x squared will just be x for the same argument. The square and the radical cancel each other out. This is an example of a linear equation. So I don't have to do any factoring or anything crazy here. The linear equations get solved very simply. We just solve for x by combining like terms. So I can move the x over to the left-hand side, and because it's positive on the right, when I move it, it becomes negative. Here, I have a negative 8 on the left-hand side, so when I move it to the right-hand side, it becomes positive 8. 3x minus x is 2x, and then divide by 2, you get x equals 4. x equals 4 is a potential solution. We don't know that it's a solution or not, so we have to check it. So we plug in 4 into our equation here and for x here, and we end up with 0 equals 0. That means that 4 is a solution, and there are no extraneous or false solutions. Here's a little more complicated question. Instead of it equaling 0, let's say it's equal to 1. Well, we start by doing the same thing. We isolate the radical. Now, if we cannot isolate the radical and have just one radical by itself, the next best thing is get one radical on each side. Because once you move the, uh, the negative radical x to the right, it will become positive radical x. But we won't really be able to isolate it because there's this one here. So it, it really should say here, isolate the radical. If not possible, then get one on each side. Now once I have that, I can square both sides. Again, please remember that I'm squaring sides, not terms. Never, ever, 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 ever do this. 1 plus root x, the quantity squared, is never going to be the same as 1 squared plus root x squared. You cannot distribute powers over sums or differences. So if this had been a minus, you wouldn't be able to do that either. You must use either this formula or foil it out the long way. And if you use the formula correctly, it actually is a lot faster. So a squared would be the first term squared. 1 squared is just 1. 2ab means 2 times 1 is 2. 2 times radical x is 2 radical x. And then b squared is radical x, the quantity squared, which is just going to be x.
So 2x plus 1 comes along for the ride because it, we cleared out the radical by doing this. Here we are left with 1 plus 2 root x plus x. Now if you look at what type of equation this is, this is not a linear equation because I have a square root of x in it. It's not a quadratic equation either because not only do I not have a square, I also have the square root of x. So this is actually another radical equation. It's just like the one we started with, with one fewer radical. So if we start with two radicals and then we're able to do some algebraic massage or manipulation and turn it into an equation that has only one radical, we went in the right direction. We, we did something that was worth doing. So now what we essentially have left over is just a brand new question. So instead of solving this one, we've said, okay, I don't want to solve that one, but I will solve this one instead. So let's do that. Again, the same principle, principle still applies, that we have to isolate the radical. That means I have to get rid of this one and I have to get rid of this x. So when I move them over, it becomes negative one and minus x. The 1 and the negative 1 cancel each other out. 2x minus x gives me just x. 2 radical x comes along for the right. The radical is by itself, so I can square both sides. If I square the x, I will get x squared. When I square the 2 radical x, the 2 will apply to both these terms. So 2 squared will give me 4. Radical x, the quantity squared, will just give me x. Now why is it that I'm allowed to distribute a power here, but not here? Reason for that again is that we are not allowed to distribute powers over sums or differences. We can distribute them over products and quotients. Here I have a product, so I, cannot, I, I can distribute these uh, exponents. So 2 times 2 gives us 4 root x times root x gives us x. Now again, think about what type of equation this is. It's not linear because it's got an x squared term, but it is quadratic. And with quadratic, the same stuff we did last class, or uh, sorry, not last class, but in section 7.1 comes back in handy. So we set it equal to 0 in order to solve by factoring. So 4x goes to the other side, becomes negative 4x. And here, first thing of first rule of factoring what's the first thing we should be thinking of gcf there's a gcf of x so i factor it out and i'm left inside with x minus 4 equals 0. here is where we can use the zero product property or the zero product rule that if we have a product of two or more terms equaling zero one of these two must be zero we don't have a choice in the matter now, we don't know which one is going to be zero so we can just say Either x is equal to 0 or x minus 4 is equal to 0. x minus 4 equals 0 will give us x equals 4. Now again, as all the other questions that we've done earlier today, these are potential solutions. So you plug in x equals 0 into this original equation. You take x equals 4 as a potential solution, plug it into the original equation, do all the arithmetic, you get 1 equals 1 and 1 equals 1. This means that both x equals 0 and x equals 4 are solutions. Not just one of them, but both numbers, in fact, are solutions. The reason why the checking was mandatory is because the index in the original problem was even. This, I believe, is the last example, and it's fairly lengthy. So maybe if you need to take a break, I would take one now, stretch, and then come back for this last example. So let's say we have root 3x plus 9 minus root x plus 4 equals negative 1. Now the first rule is always isolate the radical, and if you can't, get one on each side. So I already have a radical 3x plus 9 on the left-hand side. If I pick this one up and move over to the other side, it will become a positive. So we have a negative 1 plus root x plus 4. We can square both sides because we can do that once the radicals are isolated or sequestered. If I square the left-hand side, I'm just going to get 3x plus 9 because the radical clears out 
with the power. On the right hand side, I have a plus b the quantity squared. So we must, must, must use uh, either this formula or you can foil it out the long way. So 3x plus 9 hopefully is obvious. Here, if we square the negative 1, we'll get 1. 2 times a times b is 2 times negative 1 times the root of x plus 4 plus b squared. That's the last term of the formula. So root x plus 4, the quantity squared. So 3x plus 9 just comes along for the ride, equals negative 1, the quantity squared is negative 1. 2 times negative 1 is negative 2, root x plus 4 stays. The radical and the square clear each other out, and you're just left with x plus 4. Now again, ask yourself, what type of equation do we have here? Because there's a radical in it, we basically just have a new radical equation. And we go back to step one, which is we have to isolate the radical again. Which is to say that we have to get rid of this 1, this x, and this 4, leaving behind just negative 2 root x plus 4 here. That's what we have left over. x, 4, and 1 moved over to the other side, and they all got changed to negatives. Combining like terms gives us 2x plus 4 on the left-hand side. 3x minus x is 2x. 9 minus 1 is 8. 8 minus 4 is 4. And this just comes along for the ride. Now because this is isolated, we can square both sides. So 2x plus 4, the quantity squared, equals then the entire right-hand side, the quantity squared. Here I didn't write down the formula, but it's the same formula as this. a plus b, the quantity squared. a plus b, the quantity squared. So you can either foil this whole thing out or use the formula and quickly get the answer 4x squared plus 16x plus 16 equals negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 4. So I put a 4 there. And the radical and the square clear each other out, leaving behind just the radicand or x plus 4. Every single time you clear out the radicals, whenever you get to the next step, you should always ask yourself, what type of equation do I have? Whatever the answer is, go to that particular chapter and use those techniques. So here we can see that I don't have any radicals left over. So this is most certainly not a radical equation. It's not linear because I do have a higher power of x. And in fact, it is quadratic because I have x squared. So here, first thing I did was I distributed the 4, so 4 times x was 4x, four, 4 times 4 gave us 16. In order to solve this quadratic equation by factoring, I can move the 16 and the 4x over to the left, so they become negative. The 16x minus the 4x gave me 12x, 16 minus 16 cancelled out, to get 0. And again, remember that this is a quadratic equation. And in order to solve this, we find the GCF first. So 4x can be factored out of 4x squared plus 12x. That comes here. And then using the zero product property, we can say that either 4x is equal to 0 or x plus 3 is equal to 0. This yields x equals negative 3, and this yields divide by 4, x equals 0. So these are the two potential solutions. We don't know that their solutions are not. But once you plug them into the original equation, it turns out that 0 was an extraneous or a false solution. And again, this is the importance or this is the value of checking your answers because if you just stop here and you don't check your answers, you're, you'd be inclined to say, yeah, but I have both numbers being solutions. There's no way of just looking at 0 and saying, oh, that can't be a solution. This is the only way. You have to plug it in to see if it works. And when we plug in negative 3 here, it does indeed work out to negative 1 equals negative 1. So that means that x equals negative 3 is the only solution to this equation. As I said earlier, x equals 0 was a false or extraneous solution. Now here, uh, these are just notes to end, I believe.
Remember that we must raise both sides to a power, never individual terms. So something you should never do is if you're given this question, you are never allowed to just square the first term, square this term individually and square this term individually. Never, ever, 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 ever do that. This is illegal. This is not a thing. We are not allowed to square individual terms. So to summarize, these are actually the steps and hope I, I wanted to give you the steps at the end of this lesson instead of at the beginning, because I wanted you to go back and take a look at how did I get the answer with each of the questions following these steps. The first thing I did in all my examples was that I isolated my radical. And whenever I had two of them, I got one on each side. So if you look back even at this example, last one we did, we have two radicals. In order to solve this question, I move this radical over to the other side and I have one radical on each side. Next thing, we raise both sides. And again, I know I keep saying this again and again, but please make sure you do not raise individual terms to powers. It must be that their uh, sides are being raised to the power. And we raise it to the power of whatever the index is. So if it's a square root, we raise it to the second power. If it's a fourth root, we raise it to a power of four. If it's a cube root, we raise it to a power of three. And again, for the 19th time, remember to raise the entire sides, not the individual terms. Next, once you've done that, you can use any of the formulas from chapter four to multiply the terms a little bit faster or you can just foil at that stage. Now, if you still have a radical, you go back to step one and basically start the whole thing again. If you got a radical inside of a radical, then you basically are, are given a brand new question and start from scratch and do the first three steps again. If you don't have a radical equation, you should either have at that stage, either a linear equation or a quadratic equation. If it's linear, go back and think about chapter two stuff. If it's quadratic, go back and think about chapter four, formulas, factoring, all those techniques, and basically use that in conjunction with section 7.1. And then the last step for each question, if the index is even, you must, must, must check your answers in the original equation. I hope I've given you enough examples to prove that if you skip that last step, you will keep getting, well, half credit or no credit for all these questions. You have to check your answers. I do it across the board, even though it's not a requirement for odd indices or for when you have a cube root or a fifth root or a seventh root or things like that. But I do it as a way of checking to see if I solve the question correctly or not. Whereas with an even index, you're not checking to see if you solved it correctly, you're checking to see if it even is a solution to begin with. If you have any questions, as always, please feel free to reach out. Have a nice day.